Okay, now we'll go into, we're in the creation room yet, and we'll look at different <laughs> things that's hard for evolution to explain. It's obvious here of this giraffe, and uh, the thing about a giraffe that's hard for evolution to explain is he has got a valve in the upper part of his neck, in the lower part of his neck, and actually somewhere in his legs, I'm not sure where. But, and then the other thing that's interesting is behind his brain, there's a sponge-like thing that holds oxygenated blood. Now, if this giraffe did not have all of those valves and sponge evolve at the same time, a giraffe would not exist. Because, say he didn't have anything and he's got the long neck, he just reached down to get a drink and, and all that blood run down to his head and he would pass out or have an aneurysm. And he sees a lion coming to get him, so he, he's getting a drink and he sees that lion coming, he raise up his head to run off and all the blood flows out of his head and he faints and the lion gets him and there are no giraffes. Uh, the other thing is evolution used to say that there's a giraffe formed because he started eating the trees and there are the leaves on the trees and then as, as he stretched to get higher and higher branches, his neck grew. But I'm pretty sure even evolution uh, does not believe that anymore because they took, and for generations of mice, they cut their tail off right after they were born, and for generations, they still had tails. So they pretty much uh, factually proved that that was not true. Another one that we want to look at that really amazes me, and you might be familiar with it, is the monarch butterfly. Now the monarch butterfly winters south of Mexico City in just a relatively small area, just hundreds of thousands of them. And uh, then in the spring, they fly up to southern Texas and get the milkweed and they lay their eggs on milkweed and uh, it's the bloom of the milkweed I guess and as the adult, I don't know how long the larval state is or whatever they call that state, how long that is, but the adult only lives two to four weeks and then it continues to fly further north uh, each generation until uh, late, you know, or towards the end of summer, some of them actually make it up to Canada. But for some reason, it's like the fifth generation that would make it up to Canada. Now, why it does it, I don't think anybody knows, but the reproductive system turns off. And instead of living only two to four weeks, that generation lives nine months and begins to fly all the way back down south of Mexico City and then lives through the winter and then flies north and lays its eggs uh, on the milkweed in Texas. How does, you know, several generations later, how does it know where to go? <laughs> to me, it's just, it's hard for evolution to explain it. Now, down here, one of the things I want to bring out, you see the alligator skull? Now, we've got uh, several clips. Evolution, the Grand Experiment, is the DVD. And he searched, uh, researched 60 different museums around the world. And he found, he would show a picture of an alligator skull that was found in the dinosaur layer and it was exactly like the alligator skull of modern time here now and yet it was a different genus and species if it looked exactly the same why is it a different genus and species and he said that's the way it was for insects uh, different mammals 
everything was a different genus and species, even though you couldn't tell the difference from a modern animal. So again, to me, that is observable evidence within the geologic column in fossils that shows us that ah, there's been very little change actually in some of the animals and and even well there he says there's some extinction extinctions but there shows very little change if any because you look at uh, you go to modern animals like the dog, uh, the genus and species of a um, Chihuahua and a Great Dane are the same, and yet they look way different. Or a bulldog and a Irish wolfhound, you know, has a long nose and a short uh, nose, and they're the same genus and species. Well, why did they name all of those other uh, animals different genus and species when they look the same? Now we'll move over to this rattlesnake here. And the reason we put that rattlesnake in there is this Dr. Ball, uh, he believed that the conditions before the flood, that there was a magnetic field and it was much stronger than what it is now. So he built a, a, a tank that was had the strength he thought it would have had and then he's, there's evidence that there was a greater oxygen content and probably more barometric pressure. Well, they put this rattlesnake in there and two weeks later, they milked the venom and put it under a microscope and it looked totally different. They said in the, when they first checked it, it said the proteins in that venom was just all twisted up and like tied in knots. And then in only two weeks in these conditions, that probably is like it was before the flood, uh, they were just straightened out. And he said, we didn't have the money to test it, but he said, I'm almost sure it wouldn't have been uh, poisonous at that point. So to me, that's, well, it's just an interesting thing to think about and there's at least some experimental evidence that shows that conditions were different before the flood.